Shall we begin? The Subcommittee on Energy and Mineral Resources will come to order. Good morning to everyone joining us in person and virtually. Welcome to the Subcommittee. Uh, Ranking Member Stauber, uh, I'm so glad to be with you finally in person. We've talked about this uh, in this hearing room. It's great to be back and to be feeling good about it. Likewise. We're meeting today to hear testimony on five bills related to coal community protection and revitalization. Under committee rule 4F, any oral opening statements at hearings are limited to the chair and the ranking minority member or their designee. This will allow us to hear the witnesses sooner and help members keep to their schedules. Therefore, I ask unanimous consent that all other members' opening statements be made part of the hearing record if they are submitted to the clerk by 5 p.m. today or at the close of the hearing, whichever comes first. Hearing no, ob no objection, so ordered. Without objection, the chair may also declare a recess subject to the call of the chair. Without objection, um, the member uh, from Wyoming, Representative Cheney, is authorized to question the witnesses in today's hearing. As described in the notice, statements, documents, or motions must be submitted to the electronic repository at hnrcdocs at mail.house.gov. Members physically present should provide a hard copy for staff to distribute by email. Please note that members are responsible for their own microphones. As with our fully in-person meetings, members can be muted by staff only to avoid inadvertent background noise. Finally, members or witnesses experiencing technical problems should inform committee staff immediately. <coughs> With that, I'm going to begin my opening statement. For most of this nation's history, coal has been the dominant source of energy. For over a century, the coal industry supported well-paying union jobs and provided honest work for generations of families. Workers and their families take well-deserved pride in coal's role in building a prosperous U.S. economy. But for more than a decade now, coal mining and its use as an energy source has steadily declined. There are several factors at play. The rise of low-cost renewable energy and competition from natural gas, which has led, and the competition from natural gas, which has led to the closing of hundreds of coal mines. When coal plants retire, they more often are being replaced by new renewable energy rather than a new coal plant. In fact, no new coal plants have come online in almost 10 years. Coal is also our most polluting source of energy. If we're going to leave any recognizable world for future generations, we must transition away from coal and towards new low carbon sources. And while the coal industry helped coal communities across this country prosper, we've now seen also devastating health, environmental, and even long-term economic impacts. Cancer occurs at significantly higher rates in communities with mountaintop removal mining. Water pollution from abandoned coal mines has devastated thousands of miles of streams and rivers. Unreclaimed mountains of waste rock, 
create looming threats of landslide for homes downhill. And as coal declines and companies go bankrupt and move out of town, communities that relied almost entirely on coal are left with few economic prospects. A black lung epidemic, ravaged landscapes, polluted waters, and no way to clean up the mess. This is not right, it's not fair, and it's a matter of environmental justice. The solution to this unfolding crisis is not to provide false hope that coal will come back to town. We know that that is not going to happen. The solution is to provide new opportunities for workers and new opportunities for towns to grow and thrive. To protect these communities at the front line of the energy transition, we need commit to commit to managing the collapse of coal in a way that promotes environmental justice, protects workers, and creates opportunities for long-term economic development. Unfortunately, we've seen that the rules and regulations at the state and at the federal level are not currently up to the task. They were never designed to oversee a failing industry. That is why today we are here to discuss several pieces of legislation that will protect and revitalize community most affected by coal's decline. I see today's hearing as a culmination of the work that the committee has done on coal this con Congress. <clears throat> we'll discuss reforms to ensure that coal companies pay to reclaim the land that they mine and funds to help states and tribes clean up what coal companies have already left behind. He said what I'm going to say. <laughs> okay. We'll discuss a technical fix to the bipartisan infrastructure law that will allow states and tribes to use those funds to clean up devastating water pollution in addition to protections for residents near mountaintop removal mining. Efforts like these are proven to have outside, outsized benefits. We can put former miners back to work while simultaneously restoring land, air, and water so that these places can attract investments and new opportunities. I look forward to hearing from today's witnesses on their personal accounts of the issues at hand, and I look forward to hearing potential solutions. Before I turn it over to Ranking Member Stauber, I want to note that we did not invite the administration to, to testify at today's hearings, but have asked OSPAR and BLM to submit written policy statements. OSMER does not yet have an appointed director, but I look forward to working with the Biden administration on the reforms that we will be discussing today. With that, I recognize Ranking Member Stauber for his opening statement. Thank you, uh, Chair Lowenthal. And again, it is great to be here with you in person, and, and I do appreciate your leadership. You know, as we get deeper and deeper into one party control, these crises gets worse and worse. Families still can't get baby formula, even through the administration, even though the administration has known of this crisis coming for months. Gas prices are literally the highest they have ever been in the history with no relief in sight. Yesterday, the national average was $4.95 a gallon. When Joe Biden took office, kicking off Democrat total control of government, the national average was $2.39. Since Democrats have taken complete control, gas prices has, have risen on average $2.56, more than 100% of what it was. And let alone diesel prices, diesel drives our economy, trucking, shipping, 
mining, logging, <coughs> and virtually every industry relies on diesel fuel. There are countless more, and I don't have the time in this opening statement to list every single one. And for today's hearing, we are going to discuss one more looming crisis, as nefarious as the others, rolling blackouts. This is a full-scale energy crisis. Every major outlet, from the liberal Washington Post to even the most local of outlets, is reporting on the rolling blackouts that will, without a doubt, hurt nearly every American in the country. <clears throat> in fact, let me start with a quote from the Minneapolis Star Tribune. Quote, power lost from retiring coal plants is exceeding the supply gained by new wind and solar farms, end quote. This isn't from a conservative outlet. This isn't even an opinion piece. This is a reported fact from the energy reporter at the Minneapolis Star Tribune. Rolling blackouts put human lives at risk and Americans pay higher energy prices regardless. And most of the bills today will only make this worse. <clears throat> Please take a moment and look at the chart behind me. This is the energy breakdown of the Mid-Continent Independent Systems Operator, or the electric grid. MISO is huge. It runs from Canada to Louisiana and from Montana to Michigan. This big gray area is coal. And what we are debating today, bills that make it harder to produce coal, bills that make it harder for coal companies to receive financing, and bills that make it impossible to have certainty. <clears throat> H.R. 7937 creates backwards incentives forcing states to put together even more stringent bonding requirements based on the false premise that the industry is on the verge of collapse. <clears throat> Clearly, proponents here are ignoring the fact that demand for coal remains extremely high. The cash price of Appalachia coal increased 40% this year, <clears throat> excuse me, hitting a record of $129.65 per short ton by the end of May. H.R. 2505 prohibits self-bonding entirely, an incredibly valuable tool while H.R. 2073 bans mountaintop removal. H.R. 4799 is an old retread. It legislates over an Obama-era evaluation rule that was predictably beaten by the courts, like countless other Obama rules during the original war on coal. However, H.R. 7283, or the STREAM Act, is the only bipartisan bill offered today which provides a straightforward fix on funding for AMD. The anti-coal bills being considered represent the strong federal hand from this failing majority and president, turning up the price of energy once again for all constituents. We need to instead step out of the way and let the states do their job. The Surface Mining and Control and Reclama Reclamation Act is clear. States have primacy over regulation and reclamation activities. SMACRA requires operators to clean up the land and post bond. Reclamation often occurs simultaneously with the projects, resulting in improved landscapes and useful landscapes. Yes, we have sins of the past, and yes, it is incumbent upon us to address them. But the legislation today does not address the problems that we face. In fact, the only, they only further threaten the feedstock for our already unreliable power grid and attack and attack another American energy source. Meanwhile, we have seen a 6% increase in emissions under Joe Biden's first year. Whereas every year of the Trump administration average, averaged a reduction of 2.5%, and this is according to the Global <coughs> Carbon Atlas. So what is the Democrats' answer? Lift a tariff investigation on Chinese solar panels made with slave labor and laundered through, through other countries in Southeast Asia. And what are those Chinese manufacturing plants powered by? Coal. Without SMACRA, without environmental regulations, and of course, no labor regulations. In fact, China has begun construction on a 33,000 new megawatts of coal plants. Yes, that's correct. <clears throat> 
To boost, the little, uh, to boost the little sliver on this grid behind me of solar panel, this president is lifting tariffs on solar panels made with slave labor. Let alone, these panels wouldn't even make a difference. Democrats refuse to acknowledge that permitting restrictions make it nearly impossible to build new transmission lines. So let's be honest, Joe Biden, together with 85 House Democrats, lifted tariffs on solar panels that we likely can't even use, made with slave labor at manufacturing plants powered by an already massive and growing coal fleet. Democrats here are selling a de facto ban on coal package as a solution to climate change. And I ask that it not fool you. Mr. Chair, I yield back and I look forward to questions. Thank you, Rep <clears throat> Thank you Representative Stauber. I'm now going to introduce our first panel of congressional witnesses to speak on the bills before us today. Representative Cartwright from Pennsylvania's 8th Congressional District, welcome back to the committee. It's, it's great to see you. Always look forward to seeing you. And you are now recognized for five minutes of questions. Thank you, Chairman Lowenthal, Ranking Member Starber, and thank you to the subcommittee members here today. Uh, my home state of Pennsylvania has many beautiful natural attributes, but our orange waterways, and we have some of those, are not among them. As this subcommittee well knows, when water runs over oxidized pirate from abandoned coal mines, it turns orange and becomes toxic to all wildlife. Acid mine drainage, AMD, affects ecosystems in over 5,000 miles of Pennsylvania's waterways. No one really wants to work or live near these rivers and streams, uh, and that causes uh, in turn, an annual loss of 20 $29 million in revenue from lack of fishing alone. We already have the technology to restore these ecosystems that are original beauty, bringing back lost biodiversity, recreation, and economic activity. And the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act made a historic $11.3 billion investment to address abandoned mine lands and start the process of treating AMD. But AMD treatment requires significant, costly, and ongoing maintenance. And that part, unfortunately, is not covered by the IIJA. The legacy that uh, AML, rec AML Reclamation Program, which has been on the books for years, does allow states to set aside up to 30% of their annual regular AML allocation in interest-bearing accounts to cover the long-term ongoing costs of operating AMD treatment facilities. But those are small sums compared to the IIJA, 11.3 billion, which does not grant that same set-aside authority, thus limiting states' ability to use its historic investment to address their orange water problems. My bill, the, H, uh, the STREAM Act, H.R. 7283, would allow state allocations from the IIJA to be utilized flexibly in the same way that their distributions from the basic AML trust fund can be right now. Up to 30% could be set aside from the annual IIJA grants to treat future acid mine drainage, which again is costly permanently to address. The STREAM Act does not affect the IIJA's distribution amounts to states at all. It simply changes the allowed use of a state's fund if it chooses to have a set-aside program under its own state law. So I'm grateful the Natural Resources Committee has taken an interest in this bill proposal, and I thank you for uh, Ranking Member Stauber's kind words about that bill. I'm also pleased to have two other bills being considered today by the EMR subcommittee, the Coal Cleanup Taxpayer Protection Act and the Coal Royalty Fairness and Communities Investment Act. 
The first one, the Coal Cleanup Taxpayer Protection Act, H.R. 2505, will ensure that coal companies, not taxpayers, finance cleanup for mines that cease operations. For required insurance against environmental damage, many coal companies today use self-bonding methods, which is essentially turns worthless if the company goes bankrupt and goes out of business. At that point, it's the taxpayers who pick up the tab. My bill will eliminate self-bonding and require that all state bond pools remain stable and sufficient for their purpose. And the second bill is the Coal Royalty Fairness and Communities Investment Act, H.R. 4799. It closes coal royalty loopholes that have been taken advantage of in the federal royalty payment system. Uh, it exacerbates our, our annual deficit. Uh, it util, util, the bill utilizes the revenue captured by doing so to fund economic development projects in coal communities that have suffered job losses and growth stagnation. All of these bills would repay the communities that fueled America's growth in the nation we are to, into the nation we are today. Uh, in particular, Mr. Chairman, the STREAM Act can make a difference right now on the heels of our enactment of the IIJA in repairing the scars left on many coal communities. So I thank the subcommittee for its action today on this and other unique legislative proposals. And Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Representative Cartwright. We appreciate your time. Representative Yarmouth is from Kentucky's third congressional district. It's great to see you as well in the committee. Welcome. You are now recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you very much, Chairman Lowenthal, Ranking Member Stauber, and members of the subcommittee. Uh, thanks for inviting me here this morning to consider the important legislation that is before you, including my bill, the Appalachian Communities Health Emergency, or AIC Act. This legislation is simple. It would require that a federal study be conducted of the health effects on the surrounding communities of mountaintop removal mining sites before new mining permits are issued. It's a bill I've testified before this committee uh, before and something I worked closely on for nearly a decade with our former colleague in Harlan County, Kentucky native, the late great Congresswoman Louise Slaughter. It's not hard to see why this study is so important. In fact, all you need to do is look at this bottle of water that I brought with me today. Uh, Congressman Cartwright talked about orange water. Here it is in, the, in person. Uh, None of, the, none of us would drink this. If you lived in a home where this substance came from, the faucet, you wouldn't cook with it. You wouldn't bathe your kids in it. I say substance because it seems wrong to describe this as water. It's not only orange and cloudy. If I leave it on the table here for a little while, you'll see it separate into layers. And yet this is what comes out of the faucets in homes in parts of Eastern Kentucky. This is the reality of what countless families who reside near mountaintop removal sites in Appalachia are forced to live with. This bottle was given to me years ago by the Urias family of Pike County, Kentucky. And this is straight from the well on their property. The third well they tapped after powerful mining blast shifted and either dried up or forced their first two wells to fail. Chemicals from nearby blast sites had leached into the water table, resulting in arsenic levels more than 130 times the level deemed safe by the EPA. But the Urias family also told me about the harsh effects the mountaintop blasting had on their lives, the land on which they lived, and the community they call home. They told me about how their pediatrician warned them to make sure their then newborn baby did not open her mouth as they bathed her to be sure she wouldn't ingest accidentally, any of the water. And we can see their pain in the broader health data that is available for the Appalachian region. Higher rates of cancer than the national average, more instances of asthma, COPD, countless other respiratory illnesses, birth defects, and more. You name it, these communities are dealing with it. And while I think the connection is clear, the unfortunate reality is that we've never conducted a federally funded health study in these communities. Permit after permit has been issued, allowing coal companies to blast apart the mountains these families live among. 
but they've never looked into what happens when these materials are released into the air or into nearby streams and rivers or tumble downhill seeping into the ground until they reach the sources of water these families rely on. I want to be honest, if it were up to me, personally, I'd ban mountaintop removal mining entirely. I believe it is a destructive practice, produces smaller amounts of coal, pollutes our waterways, and leaves behind a barren earth that is almost unusable. But this legislation simply asks for a health study to determine if this practice should continue. It asks that we provide the families of Kentucky, Tennessee, West Virginia, and Virginia where this surface mining process is, uh, is used with the answers they need and deserve to protect their families. You know, it was just a few years ago that unsafe levels of lead were discovered in the water supplied to the Cannon House office building, and everyone sprung into action. Notice from House administration and the architect of the Capitol went out almost immediately to every office urging us not to drink the water. Signs went up in the bathrooms and at water fountains throughout the building, and every office housed inside that building, including my own, was provided with a supply of jugs of safe, clean drinking water. Don't the people of Appalachia deserve the, deserve the same level of urgency? Shouldn't families in coal country be given the same amount of concern as we have for ourselves? They need our help. Their health depends on it. So I urge you to join me in supporting this legislation to protect the hardworking people of coal country. And with that, once again, thank you for the opportunity to testify and I yield back. Thank you, Representative Yarmouth. I don't have any questions uh, for colleagues on the, on the panel. Representative Stauber, do you have any questions? Yeah, just real quick, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Congressman Cartwright, thanks so much for your testimony. As you stated, the STREAM Act is a meaningful fix to a drafting error made uh, in the IIJA. Um, can you just discuss briefly the importance of state decision making and how STREAM will help Pennsylvania uh, if they choose to use the AMD set aside? Sure. Uh, the, the point of the STREAM Act is to give states flexibility to hold back some of the money to use. If you go out and you, you remediate uh, abandoned mine lands, uh, there, there are a lot of, you know, a lot of them are, are, are catch basins and a, a, lot of, uh, a lot of different sort of uh, treatment of the land. And, 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 and these things, uh, they're not permanent. Uh, they need to be maintained. They need to be upgraded over time. And if you spend all of the money in the first year, uh, which would happen, could happen in, in, under the law, under the IIJA, would happen. All of that $11.3 billion is spent the first year. What do you think we're going to do? Are we going to enact an IIJA every subsequent year to, to maintain and, and, and keep up and upgrade these uh, uh, treatment facilities? No, that's not going to happen. It's not realistic. So the, the bill is simply... Uh, to be prudent in the use of that $11.3 billion and to uh, hold back some of that for the, for the ongoing maintenance of these, these coal mine remediation sites. Uh, thank you very much. Um, Mr. Chair, that's all I had. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other members uh, on the panel have questions to ask? Yes, Mr. Lambert. Mr. Chairman, I've got some really, really tough questions, but for the sake of time, I'm just going to forego those. <laughs> to, especially to my departing uh, colleague from Kentucky. So, That's a great question. Thank you. <laughs> um, Representative McCollum. Thank you. Um, we, won't, we don't have enough time to get into how the bankruptcy laws are being misused by some of the coal companies and what's happening with that. But Mr. Yarmouth, if you could um, just please tell us who um, takes care of paying for the new wells, water treatment, bottled water for all the individuals that you were talking about that you represent. <clears throat> who pays for that? Nobody's paid for it. And as a matter of fact, one of the uh, greatest sources of frustration is that while there are laws on the books that uh, actually require the coal companies to do re remediation and to clean up um, some of the damage that uh, this process does, uh, they are rarely, uh, it, those laws are rarely enforced and uh, there are 
millions and millions of dollars that actually in fines that have been leveled, levied against these coal companies that they haven't paid. So uh, the sad truth is that uh, the the cost of this damage is borne by the, the people who live in these areas. And as we know, for many of us, investing in property in a home is a way in which the middle class and, and people struggling to become in the middle class provide themselves financial stability. I would assume we have a lot of wells in Minnesota. I would assume if you have a bad well, your property becomes rather worthless. Is that not correct? I don't think there's any question that if you don't have access to uh, clean, safe drinking water, your home is, uh, is not worth very much. Mr. Cartwright, um, one of the things that I've been concerned on, on serving on the Appropriations Committee for the Department of Interior is that when we issue leases to companies who are looking to make profit, that we don't put taxpayers in harm's way for cleanup. And so we have some bills that are going to address that. I know that you work with your local municipalities a lot. I've worked with you on, on stormwater issues and the rest. What is the burden to the, to the taxpayer, the federal taxpayer, the state taxpayer, the local taxpayer? You don't have to give me an amount, but just kind of tell me the burden that the taxpayer is paying for people at one time who make great profit doing this and sometimes use public leased land paying very little on their royalties or leases. Oh, I can give you a dollar figure, Chair McCollum. Uh, it's $11.3 billion that taxpayers are paying for coal companies that went out of business and did not leave money around for the cleanup of what they left behind. Uh, this is uh, something that commentators, uh, economists, have commented on for years, that uh, it, there, there's, there's less than a full accounting going on. This is, uh, this is cooking the books. This is fudging the numbers when we don't account for what the cleanup costs are. And you can talk about how profitable operations are, but part of that profit should be taken and put toward eventual cleanup of what they leave behind. They leave scars on the landscape in Pennsylvania and Ohio and West Virginia and Eastern Tennessee and Kentucky and, uh, and it's taxpayers that are picking up that tab. Thank you, Mr. Cartwright. Um, some, of, some of this even goes to states that implement weak bonding mechanisms that they know that aren't going to be sufficient to cover the cost, so then it, it, more of it falls on, on the, on the uh, tax, uh, taxpayer uh, federally. Um, there is testimony, Mr. Chair, I won't read it because it will be submitted to the record, but about how some companies have uh, found loopholes around bankruptcy laws by um, when they're not profitable anymore, selling to a small company to get rid of any of their environmental liability policies that they have paid on, that the insurance companies are not going to have to pay on now because they've, they, 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 they sell their company until their point. It's such a small company, there's no profit in it, that it all falls on the taxpayer. Um, I will close with this. Coal is part of the mix. Coal's part of the mix for our national defense. I know we hear a lot about how Democrats don't care about national security and national defense. I chair the Defense Subcommittee on Appropriations. In Alaska, for some of our air bases, it's coal. And it's going to be coal for a long time because that's our only source. But we have to, remi we have to mine the coal in a responsible way as we continue to use it so we don't put taxpayers at risk and we don't have people not having access to potable drinking water. With that, I yield back, and I thank you for the hearing, Mr. Chair. Are there any other questions? Not hearing any, I want to thank Representative Cartwright and Representative Yarmouth. You're both welcome to stay for the rest of the hearing if you'd like, but you're also free to go. I'm not sure which you'll choose, and I think we'll have a little lottery up here to see which you choose. I now invite our second panel of witnesses to take their seat at the witness table. Are they here? Cool. I don't see anybody. He is.
Welcome. We have, um, I'm going to introduce the witnesses. Some are remote, some are here. Mr. John Dawes is the executive director of the Foundation for Pennsylvania Watersheds. Welcome. Ms. Erin Savage is uh, the Central Appalachian Senior Program Manager for Appalachian Voices. Ms. Elaine Tanner is the Program Director for Friends for Environmental Justice and an Impacted Community Member. And um, Mr. Todd Parfit is the Director of the Wyoming Department of Environmental Quality. Let me remind all the witnesses that under our committee rules, they must limit their oral statements to five minutes, but their entire statement will appear in the hearing record. When you begin, the timer will begin and it will turn orange when you have one minute remaining. I, re I re recommend that members and witnesses who are joining remotely pin the timer on their screen. After your testimony is complete, please remember to mute yourself to avoid any inadvertent background noise. I will allow the entire panel to testify before questioning the witnesses. Mr. Dawes, welcome to the committee. You're now recognized for five minutes. Chairman Lowenthal, Ranking Member Stauber, my name is John Dawes, Executive Director of Foundation for Pennsylvania Watersheds. and We use private funding to facilitate the use of abandoned mine lands fund from the 77 Surface Mine <coughs> Control Reclamation Act from the 2016 Amler Program, Abandoned Mine Lands Economic Revitalization, and now most recently the infrastructure bill referred to as BIL or the uh, Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. I cannot speak for other states, but combined those funds mean $297 million per year for my state. Um, going to our well-functioning Bureau of Abandoned Mine, Land, uh, Mine Land Reclamation, known as BAMR. In Pennsylvania, we have a well-structured system of watershed associations, conservation district offices, municipalities, good Samaritans, and uh, they complete restoration work in our state. Our role at the foundation is to provide small grants to these good Samaritans to perform watershed assessments that document legacy mining impact, sometimes in their own neighborhoods. The compiled information is submitted to BAMR for consideration and approval of a qualified hydrologic unit, which is statutory, necessary to access federal funding from the Office of Surface Mining Reclamation and Enforcement. Pennsylvania Good Samaritans have constructed 283 AMD passive treatment systems using local, state, philanthropic, and their own funds uh, from membership. Uh, BAMR has constructed an additional 50 more, uh, as well as active treatment systems. SMACRA allows for the states to set aside 30% for operation and maintenance and replacement, which we call OMNR, but does not allow OMNR for the Good Samaritan built systems. Despite the existing set aside provisions, some states have inadequate funding levels to ensure future OMNR. Now I'm here for this, about the Stream Act, safeguarding treatment for the restoration of ecosystems from abandoned mines. It's necessary to protect the nation's existing treatment systems, which we refer to in Pennsylvania as as-built water infrastructure. After SMACRA was amended in 1992, some states built uh, several systems and were authorized to set aside up to 10% of their annual AML grants. The 30% came in 2006 with reauthorization. However, SMACRA generated AML grants were limited in size and forced states to make decisions about AML health and safety inventories and polluted water supplies 
AML emergencies and AMD treatment as well as, as the set aside. States have been responsible, balancing public perception, treatment needs, and being cognizant of future treatment expense and the inability uh, to take care of that. Qu consequently, few states have elected to take the full 30% set aside. IMCC, the Interstate Mining Compact Commission, has a document which is included in my written testimony that set aside has been at about 8% uh, across the nation for those states that have a set aside program. Mine drainage treat treatment systems are classified as either active or passive, and Pennsylvania has 333 systems. Now, we do know what's going on with, with many of these systems. Um, the foundation funded this report, and there's a link in my testimony related to that. Uh, Kiski Kanama Basin Treatment System um, for uh, determining how they are performing. And we need to do that across the state, really across the nation. Um, this is an issue in 13 states with uh, passive treatment systems. I, I'd like to say it's a jobs issue. Um, it's a quality of life issue. Former director of OSMRE, Joe Pizarczyk says, nobody goes orange water rafting, they go white water rafting. Fish and Boat Commission, as Congressman Cartwright mentioned, um, has estimated a $29 million annual loss in fishing revenue because of acid mine drainage. Our number one water quality problem in the state of Pennsylvania. Thank you, uh, Mr. Dawes. Ms. Savage, uh, you're recognized for five minutes. Good morning, Chair Lowenthal and Ranking Member Sauber. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak with you. My name is Erin Savage, and I'm a Senior Program Manager at Appalachian Voices. I've spent the last decade leading a team working on the impacts of mountaintop removal coal mining in the central Appalachian states of West Virginia, Virginia, Kentucky, and Tennessee. I'm here today to talk to you about the continued impacts of surface mining in central Appalachia and to also highlight a new concern, that a significant amount of coal mine reclamation at modern mines will be left incomplete by the coal companies responsible for that reclamation. The bills under consideration today could address both the ongoing impacts of surface mining and the reclamation backlog. Coal mining across the country has undergone a significant decline in the last decade, but mining is still taking place and new permits are still being granted. For example, the Turkey Foot Permit is a pending surface mine permit from Alpha Metallurgical Resources. Located in Raleigh County, West Virginia, it is another expansion of Alpha's mines on Coal River Mountain. That would cover over 1,000 acres and include four valley fills. By any standards, it's a large mountaintop removal mine. Now, we're also seeing a growing issue of a lack of coal mine reclamation in central Appalachia and also across the country. To be clear, I'm not talking about pre-1977 or pre-SMACRA AML sites that are covered by the AML program that recently got funding through the infrastructure bill. I'm talking about mines permitted under the Surface Mining Control and Reclamation Act, or SMACRA, that should have reclamation completed by the coal companies that hold the mining permits. When SMACRA was passed, it attempted to make sure that new mines would be reclaimed by instituting reclamation requirements and requiring coal companies to secure reclamation bonds that would fund reclamation should the companies fail to do the reclamation themselves. But SMACRA wasn't designed to function well in a declining industry. Lax bonding practices, like allowing self-bonding and bond pools, have resulted in bonds that won't cover the true cost of reclamation. And enforcement mechanisms, like denying new permits, mean little to companies that don't want those permits anyway. 
The scope of the problem isn't well documented by state or federal agencies. So last year, my team and I compiled state data to try to better understand the extent of the problem. We determined that over 630,000 acres or 1,000 square miles of modern mines are in need of reclamation in just the eastern coal mining states from Pennsylvania and Ohio down through Alabama. This acreage is all on permits currently held by coal companies. And based on third-party academic research, we <coughs> estimated that the cost of this reclamation is likely between $7.5 and $9.8 billion dollars but the total available reclamation bonds for those states only amounts to $3.8 billion. This might not be a problem if we were sure that all coal companies would reclaim their mines, but we know this won't be the case. We saw an initial wave of coal company bankruptcies in 2015, and at that time, mine permits in these bankruptcies were typically taken over by other coal companies. But now we're seeing a second round of bankruptcies, and this time there are fewer coal companies willing or able to take on new permits, so these permits are being forfeited to the states. We've known for some time that self-bonds and pool bonds may not function adequately in the face of widespread bankruptcy, and now we have reason to be concerned about third-party surety bonds as well. The bankruptcy of Black Jewel Coal Company and the failure of ERP Environmental has highlighted concerns regarding one particular surety, Indemnity National Insurance. Indemnity covers $65 million in ERP bonds in West Virginia and $89 million in Black Jewel bonds in Kentucky. Indemnity covers nearly two-thirds of all reclamation bonds in the state of West Virginia. Uh, West Virginia, the West Virginia Mining Agency has expressed concerns that indemnity may be unable to provide bonds if even one large company fits a significant number of permits. Indemnity provides bonds in at least 12 states across the country. The Renew Act, H.R. 7937, is a meant, meant to address these bonding shortfalls. It would create a safety net for state regulatory agencies, providing funding for gaps between reclamation costs and the available bonds at forfeited coal mines. It would not be a coal company bailout because grants would be made to state agencies and could only be used at forfeited mines. After more than a century of coal communities providing power for our country, the least we can do is make sure that all mines are properly cleaned up. Thank you, <clears throat> thank you, Ms. Savage. Uh, Ms. Tanner, you are now recognized for five minutes. Good morning, Chair Chairman Lowenthal, Ranking Member Stauber, and distinguished members of this subcommittee. Let me thank you for this opportunity to share my thoughts on the need for continuing support for our abandoned coal communities. My name is Elaine Tanner, and I come to you as an impacted citizen living at Ground Zero in a remote mined out community in Letcher County, Kentucky. I'm here to ask for your support by approving adequate funding to address these modern day mining issues so we can begin to focus on the health and safety of our people moving forward to protect our environment. Help us to make a stand where regulations fail to hold coal companies responsible for their extractive practices. I am founding now program director for Frontline Community Outreach Organization, Friends for Environmental Justice. We formally organized Friends in 2015 out of necessity, realizing dirty water was not isolated to Appalachia. Jimmy Hall is my partner of 30 some years. Sixth generation born in a 245 acre tree farm purchased from his uncle's estate in 2004. He accepted a mining lease for what it was until it was no longer acceptable. In 2008, Consol walked away shifting blame to Dean Mining Rhino, leaving high walls, boulders, ponds, and barren remediation sites. The state claimed Consol's reason for not complying was apparently they did not know Jimmy owned his property. Consol claimed ownership to Jimmy's property, falsifying state permits, then changing the reclamation plan to escape responsibility for reclaiming these disturbed areas. In the fall of 2019, we retired to Beaver Mountain. 2021, we experienced a rainfall event causing a water way to fill with trees, boulders, and mud. The water over the debris came over the debris in the middle of the night within 15 feet of our house. The state removed original bonds prematurely, although inadequate, we did regain reclamation status. At the time, Dean Mining Quest was in negotiation to pay fines and immediately fix the problem till the next time. Fact is, 
Kentucky's had Kentucky properly addressed permit actions under SMACRA, we would not be here. This happens. Not much difference on the left fork of our holler still owned by industry. We had two major events back in 2016 at this headwater. Again in 2020, the right side of the left fork spurted mud and coal debris out of the side of the mountain. Mill Creek looked like a milkshake, the color of coffee and cream for days. The state's response was immediate. However, the remediation took a year. Again, Dean Quest was in negotiation on fines and decided to start the project in the middle of winter one year later. Had, this has the appearance of one of those forever problems we talk about. See links in my written testimony. The left side of the fork is another story. The site was remediated in 2006 when a mine from a pre smacra was nicked during modern day mining of the headwater of Mill Creek. Today, portals of this pre lost stream created several acres of wetlands above our community. I have requested inspection several times before December 2021, and I am still waiting. Coal is first washed at a nearby processing plant, depositing byproducts containing rare earth minerals into a coal slurry pond. It is held back by an earthen dam. For 10 years, I have sampled waters coming from this mitigated slurry flowing into Rockhouse Creek. Trouble is, conductivity to sustain life is at 300 parts per million, and my readings are repeatedly showing 1,900 parts per million. See written comments again for a link to these photos. No worries, industry has a plan. The future profitability seems to be in studying how to extract these critical minerals from coal slurry then transport to an existing facility. Modern day mining is creating new fears. We lack regulations for this modern day mining, again, exposing communities to unknown risk. We are connected to the land and feel the need to fight for both social and environmental justice, not offered to the people in these sacrifice zones, having given their lives to keep this country going. We know what would take, what would shake the ancestors planted up on the side of the mountain. Now is the time to protect our Appalachian communities with your bipartisan support for the Stream Act. We need more funding for these inadequately funded sites under SMACRA. In our case, a modern day mine fell through the cracks of a broken system. Its coal production continues to decline. No additional funding is available to clean up and maintain these modern day mine sites. The approved bipartisan infrastructure law, AML, funding will help get it started and we thank you. In past years, Kentucky has received little funding for AML cleanup. We're excited to see more money coming to Kentucky, but also make note, we need funding to be assured these mines stay safe and underground mines continue to fill with water creating havoc on our people and the mountains we call home. Thank you, Ms. Tanner. <clears throat> Mr. Parfit, you are now recognized for five minutes. Welcome back to the subcommittee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, good morning, uh, uh, Chairman Lowenthal, Ranking Member Stauber, and members of the House Subcommittee on Energy and Mineral Resources. My name is Todd Parfit, and I am the director of the Wyoming Department of Environmental Quality. Wyoming has over 40 years of experience in successful coal mine reclamation and coal reclamation bonding. Wyoming currently manages 26 coal permits. Wyoming implements a full cost bonding program and the active disturbance represents approximately 2 billion of reclamation bond liability. This bond liability includes current disturbed acres plus the next one year of projected disturbance. The self-bonding regulations adopted by OSM require an operator to qualify based on a five-year continuous operation history and one of three basic options based on an ultimate parent credit rating of A or higher or a tangible net worth and on balance sheet ratios of assets versus liabilities. In order to reduce risk associated with the SMACRA self-bonding provisions, Wyoming in 2019 updated its self-bonding regulations based on credit risk and established three tiers of long-term credit rating requirements for the ultimate parent entity and the subsidiary. Corporate entities that qualify, qualified for self-bond under the federal SMACRA provisions prior to 20, the 2015 bankruptcies would not qualify under Wyoming's 2019 revised regulations. The 2022 
Wyoming passed legislation that created a voluntary irrevocable assigned trust. The assigned trust creates an account for each individual permit. The assigned trust is a cash back instrument that is held and invested by the state treasurer and protected from bankruptcy claims. Wyoming believes that a better approach to addressing concerns with self-bonding is to revise the bonding program rather than eliminate self-bonding altogether. Now, the topic of coal royalties was addressed by Governor Gordon's chief energy advisor, Randall Luthi, in his October 2021 testimony to this subcommittee, emphasizing that the federal coal program has been and continues to be a success for both federal taxpayers and the citizens of Wyoming. As such, no changes to the program are necessary. When evaluating the current federal royalty rate of 12.5%, one must also factor in the rate per ton paid on the bonus bid. The 12.5% royalty is based on actual tons mined, uh, actual tons mined. The bonus bid is paid on total tons within a leased coal block as defined by the BLM. If the average bonus bid rate of 8% is added to the federal royalty rate, the actual return on the federal mineral is 20.5%. Proposed changes that result in an increase in federal royalties that are based on three-year market index pricing on the final sale point would result in increased cost to consumers and would act as a deterrent to any potential future coal leasing actions. This outcome would not benefit the U.S. taxpayer and would adversely impact AML program funding and coal communities. Wyoming is a leader in carbon capture and storage. In fact, Wyoming is one of only two states that has primacy for the Class 6 Underground Injection Control Program, which is the regulatory core of carbon capture and storage. Wyoming supports robust, predictable and dedicated federal funding for carbon capture and storage projects, including projects that involve coal and gas fired utilities and enhanced oil recovery. Likewise, Wyoming supports meaningful programs supported by federal funds that assist and reinvest in coal communities, particularly investments that create high paying jobs and are in alignment with the development of new industries that repurpose existing infrastructure. As conveyed in the statement by the Interstate Mining Compact Commission, the AML program of the states where acid mine drainage is a problem unanimously support the STREAM Act. The AML programs of the other states support providing this flexibility to their sister state programs. That being said, Wyoming would suggest that similar flexibility be provided to all states to address other unique environmental reclamation needs. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today, and I hope that I can answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, I hope you can also. Uh, again, thank, I wanna thank the, testimony, uh, the panel for their testimony. I wanna remind the members that, that Committee Rule 3D imposed a five minute limit on questions. Chair will now recognize members for any questions they may wish to ask the witnesses. I'm going to recognize Representative McCollum for five minutes of questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have five minutes. I'm gonna have three questions and I will ask people to take a minute to answer the question, although I know you would like a lot more than that. So please submit any additional testimony for the record. First. Ms. Savage, uh, the lack of serious meaningful reclamation uh, coal mine projects, limits opportunities, and holds back the potential of future economic development. Can you just give us one quick example in a minute? And that's really unfair, but could you please, uh, to the best of your ability? Yeah, that, yeah that's fine. Um, so we have a lot of modern mine sites around central Appalachia that have been sitting idled for five, 10 years. Um, and a lot of these sites, if they were reclaimed, could be utilized for any number of things from forest uh, reforestation projects that provide carbon capture and um, timber potential to installing solar farms, um, to providing other types of development like housing um, or other sorts of commercial development. Um, so really Really, you know, when these sites are just left idled, they're not producing coal and they're not available for any other type of uh, useful purpose either. 
so the communities continue to suffer. Ms. Tanner, uh, you know, it, it's spoken quite awfully, and I met with minors in the past about what they've suffered for, he for health uh, injuries uh, for working in the mines. Can you maybe um, talk about a couple of the health problems related to some of this mine debris that's left behind that the population's exposed to? If you could just take a minute to mention one or two, and please supplement on anything else in writing to the committee. Uh, yes, I would say the water has been our biggest issue. Uh, just back several years ago, we had to file a Safe Drinking Water Act for our community, and we got water for 97 families pretty rapidly. We were told that the arsenic was so high in our water that we could only flush our toilets with this water. People in our community, young women had uh, gallbladder attacks. Children were having seizures. And I went door to door in our community, and every other house seemed to be having uh, cancer connected to to their family. So that is my main concern is the water. And I think that we can um, look at a health study that the Act, yeah, you know, we need that. We need this study. We've done some studies. We know Thank what's you. going on. Thank you very much. Mr. Dawes, um, acid mine drainage is a threat from not only abandoned coal mines, but other types of mining too. Uh, for example, there's a proposed uh, software cult mine in, in the Boundary Waters area in my home state of Minnesota, which is 20%. We don't put a value on water until it's gone and you don't have it, but 20% of the cleanest water in the U.S. forestry system, so clean you can just drink straight out of it. Why is this type of acid mining so difficult to clean up? Well, na natural attenuation from an underground mine is 400 to 1,000 years with subsidence. I mean, it's a, it's a long-term issue. And when it happens in a community with, without good bonding and a plan for fix-up, it condemns that community to uh, a polluted future. And, you know, the, the issue is in terms of jobs and quality of life, nobody wants to live in communities that are so polluted. Um, it's, it's a horrible uh, issue, and I think that in the future, the companies and the stockholders need to be held accountable. But could you, uh, in, in a minute remaining, um, I, I'm dealing right now with uh, not only in Minnesota, but in, in the role that I have uh, serving on some other committees, this one as well, dealing with PFAS. We can, to a degree, remove PFAS out of, out of wells. It's not the ideal condition. There's how, how to storage, how to dispose of it, everything else. But what makes some of the acid mining more difficult to, to, to clean up and mitigate, especially if it's done out in the open in, in, in forest and stream levels? Well, um, yeah, there, there is um, the, the practice of heap leaching, you know, to, to make these piles, which with rain, you know, intensifies the acidity, which follows natural hydrology and uh, leaches out of, of these mines. It's, it's you know, a, a very bad practice and... Um, you know, as we know in Pennsylvania, it goes on for generations. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll back four seconds. Thank you. I now uh, recognize uh, Representative Stauber, who I believe is going to ask Representative Tiffany. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm going to defer my comments, to, uh, questions till later, and uh, Representative Tiffany, you can have my time now. Good to go, Mr. Chairman. All righty. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Savage, um, you uh, put in your testimony, you used the phrase just economy, a just economy. What do you mean by a just economy? Well, first and foremost, I would say a just economy is defined by the local communities who are taking part in that economy. We really want to see economic diversification that is informed by local communities. So rather than defining what it looks like uh, in any particular community, I'd uh, leave it to um, the local communities to do so themselves. Would, um, would, but, you, uh, yeah. would, you, would you say that affordable energy is part of a just economy? Absolutely. 
Okay, thank you very much. Um, Ms. Tanner, um, it's, it's good to have you here today. It seems like in reading your testimony that there's a bit of a problem with the state of Kentucky. Is that right? Perhaps misallocation of funding, that type of thing. Is that accurate? No, that is accurate. There's a problem in Kentucky. The problem is the inspectors are in the past have approved permits that were not properly uh, installed in the first place. And by the time they walk in and sign off, we are left without any ramifications to go after these coal companies. So that that is a serious problem. And um, we filed for 10 days of primacy. It took almost four years to get back to us. So we are in trouble. Yeah, so uh, Mr. Chairman, I would just submit that I think um, we may have a state problem here where perhaps the regulators and others should go back to the states and make sure that they're uh, appropriately using their money and applying it where they should, rather than what we're looking at doing here today, which is more regulations, more fees, more taxes, and uh, this is not going to take us back to energy independence, which uh, we had just a few, a couple short years ago. I mean, think about it at this point. We got pipeline permits that are being held up. We see, uh, as I traveled through St. Paul the other day, just outside my district, a big billboard, let's stop natural gas um, from being produced here in America. Just a few short years ago, those same people were saying, well, we're gonna go to natural gas to replace coal now what many of us warned about a few years ago, they're putting up billboards saying, gosh, we can't have natural gas anymore. How do we have affordable energy in what is being called this transition if we're just shutting down those sources that are so abundant at this point? We have a Securities and Exchange Commission under the behest of the president that is stifling funding for fossil fuel projects. And we see the result with $5 gasoline at the pump. And we just saw this past week where we're going to, um, at the behest of the Biden administration, we're gonna remove tariffs from Chinese solar panels, uh, solar panels that are sometimes being produced via slave labor in Western China in the Xinjiang region. And I think all of us, regardless of political persuasion, including all of you here at this table, I think that you don't want to have products made that will produce the energy here in America to be made via slave labor. And I think the other thing, um, I heard the phrase used during testimony in regards to solar farms. Let's be really clear here. These are not solar farms. They are not wind farms. They are industrial projects. And in fact, I have a bill that has been introduced and I wish we could get a hearing on it called the Farm Act, which would prevent subsidies from going to these developers of wind and solar farms when they're removing productive agricultural land from production. Now, energy production is incredibly important, but I put one thing above it, food production. And we even have the president talking about, are we on the cusp, are we on the cusp of food shortages here in America. We certainly know one thing that we're headed for a shortage on. Look at this right behind us, and I suspect the ranking member is going to talk about it. For the first time, we are having real warnings being put out in the upper Midwest that we may have blackouts. We are about to become California in the upper Midwest with blackouts and brownouts. And that's because we're shutting down energy production here in America. It is time for us to take a different approach. And I would submit to you, Mr. Chairman, and the chairman of this full committee, it is time for us to get serious here in America what's going on. $5 gasoline, $2.50 a gallon for propane, triple what it was two years ago. We're seeing natural gas rates, just heard from an industrial user uh, yesterday, it is quadrupled. It's time for us to get serious and let's get back to having affordable energy here in America. I yield back. Thank you, Representative Tiffany. I'm gonna call upon myself, but in the, in the interest of time, because votes have been called and we just have a few minutes left, I'm gonna limit myself to one question and the rest I'll do in uh, written form. And my question uh, for the witnesses is, uh, I'd like to ask Ms., uh, Mr. Dawes a few questions about Representative Cartwright's bill, and I'm gonna follow the questions that were asked by Representative McCollum about acid mine drainage. 
So in the STREAM Act, which is a technical fix to the bipartisan infrastructure law, and it would allow states and tribes to use their new funds for the acid mine drainage set-aside account. Can you explain, Mr. Dobbs, uh, in more detail, why we have an acid mine drainage set-aside account in the first place, and why can't standard AML grants address acid mine drainage issues? Um, Smacker, when it was first passed in 1977, um, did not allow you know, for acid mine drainage, it was priority ones and twos, dangerous high walls, mine openings, and adits. And sometimes in, well, many, most of the time, in communities, coal field communities, the number one problem is acid mine drainage, seeping out into streams that are visible where people would like to fish. And um, in order to do that, in 92, states were allowed to utilize 10% for AMD treatment. It was a prioritization process that was statutory to SMACRA. So in the 2006 reauthorization, that 10% was upped to 30%, allowing states to empower citizens, watershed groups, uh, conservation districts, municipalities to engage in process. And without the set-aside accounts, um, that burden is going to be on those associ the Association of Abandoned Mine Land programs in each state to do it in-house. And I would argue that that's almost impossible given the great and wonderful amount of money that is coming our way. There's no complaint about the amount. Okay, I'm going <laughs> to cut you off now, not that I'm uh, not satisfied with your answer, but we're running out of time. Representative yes. uh, Stauber. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Lowenthal. Uh, Mr. Parfit, um, thanks for joining us once again. And as I mentioned in my opening statement, we remain reliant on base load coal power. It's therefore crucial that we uh, preserve a feedstock and your state, as you know so well, is our top domestic producer. Let's start with a simple yes or no question. Will these bills make it more difficult to produce coal needed to stave off devastating rolling blackouts? Uh, will these, if I understand the question correctly, um, will these bills will the, help? Yeah, I'll read. Will, the, will these bills make it more difficult to produce coal needed to stave off devastating rolling blackouts? Yes. And then thank you, HR 2505 would bar states from utilizing self-bonds. Why is self-bonding important and why should those decisions be made at the state level in your opinion? Well, self-bonding is important because it's another available tool and with the changes that we've made to the self-bonding rules, we think that, that it, it reduces the amount of risk associated with self bonds in the previous uh, rules that we had that were shaped after OSM's uh, self bonding rules. And states can react quicker uh, to making those changes than uh, the federal agencies. And, and so this is a follow up to that. Uh, why did Wyoming choose to maintain the self bond and what was the goal of those regulatory changes? Well, again, uh, the reason we made the changes was because we, we recognized that from the bankruptcies and other uh, reasons that uh, we needed to update the self bonds and keep it as an option for uh, meeting the bond obligation. And quite frankly, uh, some of the bond obligations for the size of the mines in the West, uh, you need to have as many tools as you, as you have available. Um, it, it's unclear whether the $75 million allocated to the Coal Area Economic Revitalization Fund would come from the state or federal share of coal leasing revenues under H.R. 4799. And I'm worried this will impact state coal revenues. How important are these state revenues, and how would reducing the state share of coal leasing revenues impact your state of Wyoming? Yeah, the, the, the revenues from the federal uh, 
coal royalties in leasing is very important to Wyoming. It's the second uh, uh, highest source of revenue for the state, and it is utilized for education, for school uh, construction, and highways. Thank you very much, Mr. Parfit. Again, it was uh, great to see you. And I want to thank all the witnesses for their testimony. Mr. Chair, back to you. Thank you. Unfortunately, votes have been called. And so we're going to have to adjourn this hearing. Apologize to the witnesses, of whether they're remote or here, Mr. Dawes, uh, for this abrupt close. Thank you to all the witnesses for your time and expertise this morning. All of the subcommittee meet, uh, members have copies of your full written testimony and will submit their questions to you in writing. Under committee rule 3.0, members of the committee must submit uh, written questions within three business days following the hearing, and the hearing record will be held open for 10 business days for these responses. If there's no further business, without objection, this subcommittee stands adjourned.